And so, our speaker this morning, with his usual wit and charm, is here to share with us another message that will be insightful and inspirational, and that will guide us as we move along our pathway of spiritual growth and unfoldment. So please help me welcome our pastor and our spiritual leader, Reverend John Scott, to the podium. Isn't it strange that princes and princesses, queens and kings, and clowns that dance in sawdust rings, and common people like you and me are builders for eternity? For each is given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass, and a book of rules. We shape this mass as time has flown and create stumbling blocks or stepping stones. Good morning, my beautiful family. Good morning. And if you're joining us on the World Wide Web, good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome. Please high five someone near you and say, we're builders for eternity. We're builders for eternity. That's the title of my encouragement this morning. We are builders for eternity. And you know, I, I am pretty sure that my father, my late father, knew nothing about Leroy Sibley's, the, the composer of that song, or the Heptones, the, the group um, in, the, in the 60s, which, which gave us that wonderful song. But he, his soul must have known metaphysics, because on the eve of my 21st birthday, Minutes to midnight, he came into my room and said, can I sit on the bed? And he did. And he handed me a card, a birthday card, and a package. And the package contained a packet of plasticine. Remember plasticine? Plasticine was this malleable putty modeling clay. I think the modern version is, is Play-Doh. And said, son, he used to call me lad, actually. And he said, lad, I said, you know, Plasticine. I'm 21. He said, lad, it is to remind you that you can make of your life whatever you want. Wow. A shapeless mass. A shapeless mass to be molded as I saw fit. And 16 years later, I discovered this teaching, this powerful transformative teaching known as the science of mind. And what do we teach? We teach that you can use the mold created by your thoughts and feelings for the universe to pour into it the undifferentiated substance which creates the life we want, the life we crave, and the world that we, we want to see about us. Isn't that just amazing? That all of life, it's, it's almost as if you're being prepared for where you are right now. It's not almost. You are being prepared and have been prepared for where you are right now. And friends, we need to remember that we come with a bag of tools. And for me, the key tool in that toolkit is the love that we bring with us when we come to this plane of existence. Love is the key that links us to the unified field, this extension of all of creation that brings us close to every single part of creation so that this oneness that is created is a very real experience for each and every person who would use what is in their bag of tools to shape that shapeless mass to make stepping stones and not stumbling blocks for our lives and for the lives of others. And so, you know, my friends, it doesn't matter what the book of rules is. It may be the Holy Bible. It may be the Quran, it may be the Bhagavad Gita, it may be any of the ancient scriptures, it might even be a modern book like, re re relatively modern, like Conversations with God, or an ancient book like Course in Miracles. Whatever the book is, because all the books say the same thing. It boils down to one thing, love one another. 
it is love. That's what we're here to do, to love. And that's why I'm so moved and so touched by Jordan's Feeding of the 5,000 program and why I am so excited about this initiative we're calling the Thriving Ministry Initiative because it is a movement of love. And I want to talk a little bit about it this morning. So it's a, a profound spiritual truth that love is the cornerstone and the, the building block. There's a wonderful story, you know, which I believe, I think it originated with the Catholic priest, Anthony de Mello, and I read it in one of my uh, books by one of my favorite authors, Joan Borisenko. And it's about a Hindu yogi whose guru left him under a tree on a riverbank to meditate on God. The yogi had only two possessions, his loincloth and a begging bowl. And once a day, he would walk to the village and beg for food. The rest of the time he spent in contemplation of God. And one night, he washed out his loincloth and hung it upon a tree to dry. And when he awakened next morning, it had been chewed up by a rat. With great embarrassment, as you may imagine, he begged for both food and a new loincloth that day. And then went back to his assignment of contemplating God. A few days later, he washed out his new loincloth and hung it up to dry. And once again, the rat named it during the night. What was the yoga to do? It was really unseemly for a man of God to, to keep begging for loincloths. So he got himself a kitten to chase the rat. But the kitten was hungry, and soon the yogi had to beg for milk. It was embarrassing to beg for milk, so he found a stray cow. All went well until the summer heat burned off all the remaining grasses, and the yogi had to beg for fodder to feed the cow. And so when the rainy season came, he planted some crops. They prospered in the rich soil, but so much of his time was spent farming that he could hardly meditate on God. So he had laborers to tend his fields, but they needed supervision. So he found himself a wife to oversee the laborers so that he could. The woman always gets saddled with the job. Don't? Yes. <laughs> Can I have an amen? <laughs> yes, so. But she didn't want to live under a tree. So they built a house. And it had to be a large house because soon she was pregnant. So the yogi grew fat and wealthy. He prospered by the banks of the river. And one day, as he was sitting under his meditation tree, resting, a familiar figure approached. It was his guru, who surveyed the scene with wide-eyed wonder and said, student, is that you? Didn't I leave you here five years ago to contemplate God? Oh, the yogi bowed his head and gestured to his vast estate, reverend teacher, I know it sounds a, a, a bit hard to understand, but truly, this is the only way I could hold on to my loincloth. <laughs> and so we're going to thrive, continue to thrive, because we want to hold on to our loincloths. But you know, the beautiful Jesus said that one cannot serve both God and mammon. And indeed, like the yogi, it's sometimes easy to forget about God union when the things of the world are calling for our attention. All of us here have tried to establish and maintain a spiritual practice, I'm sure. And we know how challenging this can be because we have to live physically in the world while hopefully using our gifts creatively and to make, it, and to make sufficient money um, so that we can sustain ourselves and those for whom we have the responsibility. But as Joan Borisenko so aptly puts it, and I quote, poverty as much as wealth for its own sake can take us away from our search for God. It is a profound spiritual truth that when we seek the kingdom of heaven first, all other things are added to us. And to fully appreciate this truth, Borisenko suggests that we need to look at the underpinnings of creativity and abundance which she describes as our ability to utilize our active male aspect <laughs> to, take, to stake out a territory 
in which to use our gifts. So we use our active male aspect to determine what it is we want to achieve. And then we use our feminine, female, receptive aspect as a womb in which to receive the inspiration that grows the gifts. When our male and female aspects combine, the miracle of creation occurs, and we give birth to wonderful ideas and projects. In so doing, we manifest spiritual abundance and share it with a generosity of spirit that inspires those around us to use their own creativity, the tools in their own bag of tools, to, to create the abundance and the life that we really all want and deserve to live. So this is what the Thriving Ministry Initiative, of which you have been hearing so much, is all about. We are going to pool our ideas, our time, our talent, and our treasure as a spiritual community so as to ensure that this church continues to thrive. My friends, I want you to know we are already a thriving ministry. You are sitting on two and a half acres of prime real estate in the middle of New Kingston. It is an oasis of beauty and peace. And the edifice in which you, you sit is owned outright. We owe no money. We are debt free as a community. That's thriving, wouldn't you agree? Yes. And our financial year ended the 30th of June. I think you'll be thrilled to know, too, that uh, when we ended our financial year on the 30th of June, we, we ended with a very healthy, healthily in the black. And as soon as the audit is done, we will share those figures with you. But we are on the, the correct side of the balance sheet. So we thrive. We are thriving. <laughs> Would you say with me, I am a thriving ministry. Uh, I am. And to your neighbor, say, we are a thriving ministry. We are a thriving ministry. So you see, friends, the thriving initiative, thriving ministry initiative, is not about fixing something that is broken or bailing out a church that is broke. No. We are thriving, and the, the reason that we are, we are excited about this initiative is we want everybody who has anything to do with this church to be a part of that, because as the church thrives, you will thrive. As you give, you too receive. And there are four prerequisites which I think uh, we can use for igniting the personal and collective transformation, which is the aim of the Thriving Ministry Initiative. The first is our intention to serve God, the God of our being, the God upon which this, this church is firmly built, the belief. And this is a science of mind church. There are many other new thought um, practices, but we practice the science of mind. That is our path, okay? And we are open to all other paths up the mountain because we believe all paths lead to God. But we teach and practice the principles of the science of mind. The second prerequisite, I think, is the belief that when we set that intention, the universe must honor it. So that when we create the mold to thrive and to be to, to make a difference in the world, the universe honors that. I was just invited by Reverend Sheila McKeithen of Universal Center of Truth for Better Living to be on a panel at their Panorama of Truth conference in August, August 10th, I think it is, 9th to 13th, I'm on on the 10th, because she wants us to tell the international New Thought community about our outreach in the prison and what we are doing to touch and transform lives without preaching any religion, without trying to convert anybody to anything, without any of that proselytizing. That ministry is called Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life. And that is what we are about. Not only changing our own thinking, but being a minister in the world so that when people see us, they can say, yeah, that's how I'd like to be. That's how I would like to live what I say I believe. And so I know I saw some people didn't put up their hands about Saturday. Cancel what you had to do and come. <laughs> Trust me, it 
it's not something you want to miss. And it's not just, um, Sandra, my beloved said, the Finnish land is, is, is actually a leisure hotel. It is the starting point because we are going to be on each other's consciousness, raising each other up and heading for the success that is already ours in the mind of God. The third prerequisite, the third requirement for thriving both individually and collectively is the practical groundedness, the knowing that the universe always says yes to what we require. And fourthly, the understanding that we really do receive as we give and that our own thriving is enhanced through service to others. And that's what I'm seeing as the basis of this wonderful initiative. And so this brings me to your assignment, which you've already got. Your assignment, should you decide to undertake it, is to be here. Sometimes we're here, but we're not there. We're here physically in the seat, and our mind is on the rice and peas, and I never remember to buy any um, coconut milk, or did I turn off the gas when I came, or the washing on the land, and is it going to rain? I want you to be here on Saturday and to bring with you your bag of tools. Because when you go home this evening, I want you to look in that bag, look within you, and you will see that all of the God qualities are in that bag of tools. Love, life, light, power, peace, beauty, and joy are what I want you to bring on Saturday so that each of us is given this bag of tools, the shapeless mass of undifferentiated substance, and the book of rules. You get that later. <laughs> Patanjali, the ancient Hindu philosopher who compiled the Yoga Sutras, which is a text of yoga theory and practice, writes, and I quote, when you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations, your consciousness expands in every direction, and you find yourself in a new, great, and wonderful world. Dormant forces, faculties, and talents become alive, and you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you have ever dreamed yourself to be." Unquote. Patanjali, he, was, he wrote the, the Yoga Sutras. And then in Isaiah 43, verse 19, we read, and I quote, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Can you perceive it? Unquote. The verse doesn't say that God is going to do a new thing someday. He didn't say maybe next week or next month or next summer maybe. God is saying, I'm doing something new in your life right now right here in this Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. Can you not perceive it, my friends, that the change is happening? And not just change, which is when I go, when I go home, I go and change my clothes. I'm going to take it off and drop it somewhere, or hopefully hang it up. That's change. And I might put it back on tomorrow. We're talking about transformation which means that when you step through that door into something new and more radiant and more beautiful, you shut the door on the past, the past doubts, the past unbeliefs, the past sense of limitation, the past sense of separation from your God source, and say, yes, I am transformed. The butterfly can never return to being a caterpillar. And so, friends, our church is called upon to be a lantern. I just think it was so so visionary of Reverend Emma Lums then to call this a temple of light because we are called to be a beacon in the darkness, a place of refuge for those feeling weary or afraid. This church is a place of fellowship, a place of instruction, and a place where the truth sets men and women free from the bondage of the past and 
frees us into the marvelous, radiant light of our Christ selves. That is what I, I call salvation, when you awaken to the truth that you are it and that we are the ones we have been waiting for. At the same time, my friends, this church can be a place of buzzing activity. Check it out on Saturday. Formed by divine ideas, which when put into action, bring growth in spiritual vision, in numbers of people, in finances, yes, and thus in services rendered to this society. So it is vitally important that each person who attends this church builds a consciousness which reflects the zest and vitality of spirit that we all are open and receptive to growth and transformation and enjoy being of service to our fellow human beings. Everyone who attends this place is God's trustee, charged with the responsibility of knowing that the truth of him or herself and teaching it through example to others. We are all ministers of this truth. We are called then to be a light in the darkness and salt for seasoning one another. I love that imagery in the Bible of salt. You know, the, the master said in Matthew 5, verse 13, in his Sermon on the Mount, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden underfoot. He was talking to his disciples about the power of consciousness, and his message is to them it still has great re re relevance for each and every one of us, because he was saying, just a pinch of salt can improve the flavor of the stew. You know that just, just a few grains of salt can change the flavor and enhance, enhance its, its flavor. And we are called to be that salt, that seasoning, which when people interact with us, when people encounter us, they are touched and healed and blessed and prospered in wonderful and amazing ways. And so I see all of you as radiating centers of truth of light, of love, and of joy. Each of us has been given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass, and a book of rules. We'll shape this mass as time has flown. Let us not build stumbling blocks, but stepping stones. Namaste.